Hearing will come to order. I really want to thank everybody uh, and welcome you to today's field hearing on VA telehealth. I especially want to thank Ranking Member Custer for joining us here in this beautiful part of the world that we call home here in, uh, in northern lower Michigan. And uh, again, I'm so glad you're with us. Uh, prior to getting started, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that a statement to be provided by the Manistee County Veterans Council be entered into the hearing record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. The VA has been using telemedicine for decades, and it is an increasingly important part of VA healthcare. I am proud that here in Michigan, we have a concentration on some of the most tech-savvy VA hospitals in the country. Hospitals and Health Networks magazine recently released its annual most wired list. That used to mean different things at different times. <laughs> you know, this is a good thing. Five VA medical centers around the country made the cut, and three of them are in the state of Michigan. Saginaw, Battle Creek, and Detroit. Now, as the President and Secretary Shelkin announced at the White House earlier this month, VA telehealth is poised for another expansion. There are actually several distinct telehealth programs, each with its own purpose and needs. Today we will examine home telehealth, which is when VA puts technology into a veteran's home to help him or her manage a chronic health condition and remotely consult with a physician. The anywhere to Anywhere initiative, which will increase VA doctors' abilities to practice beyond state licensing boundaries, and the VA Connect app, which enables video conferencing with doctors on a smartphone, should boost home telehealth. Of all the telehealth programs, home telehealth perhaps has the most impact on improving health outcomes, generating savings, and keeping thousands of elderly veterans out of nursing homes. Home telehealth is especially helpful in highly rural areas, such as you have here in the First District, especially as you get into the Upper Peninsula. Uh, VA's clinic network is impressive, but they cannot be everywhere. In many cases, like the UP, it is just not practical to drive an hour each way for a, re uh, a routine uh, consultation. Home telehealth also seems to be the most challenging for the VA. The complexity of care can be high, and managing IT equipment and medical devices in veterans' home is necessarily more difficult than doing so in clinics. There is also an elaborate supply chain to distribute the uh, equipment and an extensive IT infrastructure in which any glitch may cause cascading disruptions. VA also has a rocky history, which we all hope is behind us now and going forward with home telehealth enrollment. The Office of Inspector General audited enrollment nationally and found a pattern of less vulnerable, less challenging, challenging patients being targeted for enrollment to the detriment of more vulnerable, more challenged patients. OIG also examined complaints about the Detroit Medical Center and substantiated that employees recorded hundreds of veterans as enrolled in home telehealth when they had, in fact, received no equipment or telehealth services. The employees even entered telehealth monitoring notes in these people's health records when no monitoring had happened. In both instances, the employees were attempting to hit targets in their performance evaluations in the easiest possible way. That's wrong. When the other telehealth programs, or while other tele other telehealth programs are growing, home telehealth enrollment has declined over the last few years. There is no indication that wrongdoing is to blame, but I am concerned about this trend. I hope our witnesses today can explain that. Another important service for rural veterans is VA's mobile medical units. There are trucks, tractor trailers, RVs, and other vehicles outfitted as traveling clinics. In 2014, 
OIG found pervasive problems with their management. VA did not know how many mobile units it had, where they were located, what they were used for, and how many patients they served. Some were permanently parked, meaning in reality they were not mobile at all. In the Choice Act, Congress mandated reforms and better reporting, and today there are nearly twice as many mobile medical units. But too many of them are inactive. They are not providing services often enough to meet the Congress goal, and only a few provide telehealth. There is still quite a long way to go until the mobile medical units are being utilized to their full potential. There are over 700,000 unique veterans served by VA telehealth every year, and that is impressive, and it's growing fast. Most of them are in clinics using video conferencing and imaging to con communicate with specialists at other locations. VA seems well equipped to handle these telehealth programs, and the track record is good. I want to make sure that home telehealth is working properly for the roughly 150,000 veterans now enrolled. I also want to be confident that the program will grow to serve more people and the supply chain and IT can keep up with that growth. I now yield to Ranking Member Custer for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Bergman, and thank you for hosting here in Michigan. Uh, my husband and I have had a wonderful time in your beautiful district, and we're delighted to be here. Um, I really do enjoy working so closely with General Bergman to address many of the issues that our veterans face, and I uh, hope your constituents understand your leadership role and uh, the fact that our subcommittee and our full committee are among the most bipartisan and productive in the whole Congress. So like Chairman Bergman, I represent a mostly rural district in New Hampshire, the western uh, side of New Hampshire from the Massachusetts border up to Canada. And by holding this field hearing here in Traverse City, we have the unique opportunity to learn about the concerns of veterans in rural Michigan and how we share their concerns uh, with rural veterans in New Hampshire. When Chairman Bergman and I learn about common issues that our veterans face, we work together, and our goal is to solve these issues. So that's why we're so thankful to have uh, the VSOs with us, as well as advocates, families, and caregivers to spend their morning with us and learn about how we can do an even better job with telehealth. In New Hampshire, Michigan, our veterans face significant geographical barriers to VA health care, sometimes traveling long distances, and I can say sometimes not in the best weather, and waiting too long to receive, receive care due to a shortage of doctors or lack of hospitals or clinics in some communities. Treating veterans via telehealth has the potential to help veterans get the care they need in rural areas by saving veterans the time and often the expense of traveling to a VA facility. And we support the VA's decision and the current administration and, and Secretary Shulkin and their decision to expand telehealth. However, infrastructure is a very real barrier for expansion of telehealth initiatives in rural areas. In both rural New Hampshire and rural Michigan, the IT infrastructure, the high-speed broadband and cellular service that's necessary just simply might not exist or may be inadequate. Without this basic infrastructure to support the use of telehealth, rural veterans are still going to face barriers to accessing care. And so that's why I'm eager to learn more about the plan to expand home telehealth programming and whether the VA has plans to address the rural infrastructure barriers or is aware of other challenges that could slow or stop expansion of the program. I want to know if other successful programs designed to provide care to rural veterans face barriers that could prevent their expansion in rural communities all across the country. And I want to understand what the VHA is doing on the local and national level to overcome these barriers. We also want to ensure that the proper processes are followed so that re veterans receive quality care. Telehealth is not appropriate in many care settings, and some veterans do not want to receive telehealth treatment. Veterans should always have the ability to say yes or no to treatment via telehealth. That's why I was alarmed to learn of the actions taken by the Associate Chief of Nursing Services at the John Diggle Medical Center in Detroit. 
It's a violation of VA policy and unacceptable to add patients to the home telehealth program without their consent. I'm very concerned about performance goals being tied to home telehealth enrollment and worried that this created a perverse incentive for employees to care only about enrollment numbers so that they could receive a bonus and not about what was best for our veterans. We want to know what VA has done to ensure that employees are not incentivized to repeat this behavior under the new telehealth expansion initiative. The veterans in Michigan, New Hampshire, and all across our country deserve high quality accessible care, and I believe that the VA should be using technology to achieve these goals. However, the VA must ensure it's using telehealth and technology to best serve our veterans, which is why it is important for the VA to follow policies and why we must continue to hold oversight hearings on these issues. I thank you, Chairman Bergman, and I yield back the balance of my time. You know, you can tell I've been back in the district for about a month. I just realized there was a microphone in front of me. <laughs> because up here, we don't have a whole lot of electrons. And the point is, when we get out to talk, and I've been get, gotten in the habit of using my Marine Command voice, so if, uh, <laughs> so if I, you know, caused anybody to, you know, put earplugs in, I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> now, uh, and by the way, I'm... Uh, Representative Custer and I have been talking about this this trip uh, for a long time. I've been bugging him yeah. to come. <laughs> and, 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 and it's, it, it is great that, uh, that we've been able to finally make this happen and just know that we are headed to New Hampshire in about three weeks. Thank you very much. To, to come up we there to do it. it. Because the more you know about what's going on outside of your own backyard and how it compares, the better we become in actually delivering the services that our veterans so, I mean, they earned them, they deserve them, and by golly, we need to get them to them. So now I'd like to welcome our panel, seated here in, in front of us at, the, I hate to say the witness table, it sounds, you know, the, the bottom line is we're going to call it the presentation table today. <laughs> and on the panel, we have Dr. Kevin Galpin, who's the Executive Director of VHA Telehealth. Welcome. He is accompanied by Dr. Pamela Reeves, Director of the Detroit VA Medical Center, Dr. Alan Constant Constantian. Constantian. I thank you. Uh, Deputy Chief Information Officer and VHA Account Manager for Clinical Functions of VA's Office of Information and Technology. And we also have Dr. Thomas Wong, who is the senior physician. Uh, with the VA Office of the Inspector General. Uh, Dr. Galpin, you are now recognized for five minutes. Great. Uh, good morning, Chairman Bergman, Ranking Member Custer. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss VA telehealth, telehealth information technology, and our home telehealth program. I'm accompanied today by Dr. Pam Reeves, Medical Center Director of the John D. Dingle VA Medical Center in Detroit, Michigan, and Dr. Alan Costantian, Deputy Chief Information Officer for the Office of Information and Technology. VA Telehealth is a modern, veteran, and family-centered healthcare delivery model. It leverages information and telecommunications technologies to connect veterans with their clinicians and allied or ancillary health care professionals, irrespective of the location of the provider or the veteran. It bridges enhanced access and expertise across the geographic distance that would otherwise separate some veterans, including those in rural areas, from the providers best able to serve them. VA is recognized as a world leader in the development and use of advanced telehealth technology. In fiscal year 2016, of the more than 5.8 million veterans that use VA care, approximately 12% received an element of their care through telehealth. This represented more than 702,000 veterans and over 2.17 million telehealth episodes of care. VA's telehealth portfolio allows for enhanced clinical care delivery in over 50 clinical specialties. Services are delivered primarily through one of VA's three broad categories of telehealth. The first, clinical video telehealth, is the use of real-time interactive video conferencing to assess, treat, and provide care to veterans remotely. As an example, this can be used to provide mental health counseling to veterans closer to their home or even in their home. The second category of telehealth is store and forward. 
This is use of technologies to asynchronously acquire and store clinical information, such as a picture, a sound, a video, which is then sent and assessed by a provider at another location for clinical evaluation. This can deliver services such as dermatology and retinal screening. The third broad category is home telehealth. This is a technology-enabled remote monitoring program where clinical data information is collected through a VA-provided home-based device or through the patient's own mobile device or home computer. This allows a VA provider to monitor the veteran's health status, provide clinical advice, and facilitate patient self-management as an adjunct to the veteran's traditional in-person health care. This service can help veterans continue to live independently, reduce hospitalization, and spend less time and money for medical visits. Between 2013 and 14, the VA Office of the Inspector General audited VA's home telehealth program, providing their final report to us in 2015. The OIG analyzed outcomes for over 15,000 veterans in the home telehealth program and concluded that the program was successful in reducing inpatient admissions for all three main patient categories of care, inclusive of the non-institutional category of care, what we call the NIC category, chronic care management category, and health promotion and disease prevention category. The OIG described the program as a transformational modality for delivering quality health care that is convenient and accessible to veterans who cannot travel or live hours away from the medical facility. While the OIG found the overall program to be successful, they also concluded that the VA missed opportunities to expand enrollment for the non-institutional or NIC category, the category of enrollment with the best outcomes based on their analysis methodology. In response, they recommended, and the VHA agreed, to system enhancements that would help identify demand for NIC enrollments and establish new performance measures to promote enrollment of NIC patients into the home telehealth program. In response, VHA has revised its care assessment, assessment needs score report, so it automatically flags patients at risk for institutional care who might benefit from the home telehealth program as a NIC patient. VHA also created and implemented national home telehealth templates and reminder their dialogues that remind home telehealth staff to reassess patients' category of care at specified intervals. Finally, VHA has proposed a NIC enrollment metric for the home telehealth program. The proposal has been presented to the Performance Accountability Workgroup and National Telehealth Advisory Board with the expectation of enacting the new targets in 2018. VA has plans to dramatically enhance the VA telehealth program going forward. Related to the announcement on August 3rd by the President and VA Secretary Dr. David Shulkin, VA has sent a proposal to the Office of Management and Budget to address barriers that are adversely impacting our ability to deliver telehealth services to our nation's veterans. Once OMB is done reviewing the proposal, VA will make it public so it can be commented upon. Also noted at the White House announcement and part of VHA's new Anywhere to Anywhere telehealth initiative, VA is initiating the rollout of a new telehealth application called VA Video Connect. It provides a secure and web-enabled video service and makes it easy for veterans and providers to connect over video from any location with sufficient internet services and any capable video device. In conclusion, VA is a leader in providing telehealth services, which remains a critical strategy in ensuring veterans can access health care when and where they need it. With the support of Congress, we have an opportunity to shape the future and ensure that VA remains the leader in leveraging cutting-edge technology to provide convenient, accessible, high-quality care to veterans through telehealth. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee today. We do appreciate your support and look forward to responding to any questions uh, either of you may have. Thank you. Dr. Wong, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Custer, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the OIG's work regarding home telehealth and documentation concerns at the John D. Dingle VA in Detroit, uh, Michigan. My written statement has been submitted. Home telehealth technology and its implementation answers a fundamental question asked by many, if not all, primary care providers and their staff. How is my patient doing in between office visits? Um, home telehealth can answer that question, but, but can also make care better for our patients. Telehealth technology can also bridge the barrier of distance that prevents patients from accessing specialists. A video link paired with telehealth equipment can provide necessary information for a specialist to help a patient that can be hundreds of miles away. This program must have proper oversight for these important functions to occur. We received allegations that in the last two weeks of fiscal year 2013, 
there was improper in patient enrollment of over 900 patients in home telehealth. There was use of overtime to produce end-of-year enrollment numbers, regardless of whether patients wanted to be enrolled or even contacted. What we found was that in that period alleged, the home telehealth program enrolled 836 new patients, and the majority of those patients were enrolled in the last two days of fiscal year 2013. For those 836 patients, we expected to see 836 consults, 836 screening notes, 836 assessment notes, 836 monthly monitoring notes, all in this sequence to properly enroll a patient for telehealth care. What we found was we found 828 <coughs> patients who did not have the proper enrollment sequence, and many monthly monitoring notes were written without the required previous steps of enrollment. Monthly monitoring notes capture and generate workload for a facility. The monthly monitoring note should be the last note entered for a patient to be enrolled in a home telehealth program. In the Detroit facility, monthly monitoring notes were entered into patients' electronic health records, regardless of proper enrollment sequence, missing consults, missing screening notes, and missing assessment notes. We also determined that without the use of overtime for the last two days of fiscal year 2013, the facility could not have surpassed their workload encounters. We made several recommendations to the facility based on re-education of home telehealth staff on enrollment procedures, better oversight of home telehealth documentation. We asked VA to evaluate administrative action to the individual in allowing these notes to be entered in this manner. In summary, telehealth technology is, is an innovative way to care for patients. For those frontline staff caring for patients, telehealth allows for the processing of information to affect the lives for the better of, of patients and no doubt can save lives in the long run. But to be effective, the program must be administered responsibly so that we can affect as many lives as possible. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. Uh, I would be happy to answer questions your ranking member, Custer, may have. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wong. The written statements of those who have just provided oral testimony will be entered into the hearing record. We will now proceed to questioning. Now we're going to start. Uh, Ranking Member Custer is going to start with uh, her first question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to just go to our witness here from Detroit to give you an opportunity to respond, um, Dr. Reeves, on what steps have been taken uh, both with regard to retraining and oversight to overcome the incident that was discovered or uh, apparently there were allegations that was investigated by the Office of the Intent Inspector General. Sure. Um, so we retrained staff in 2015. We had the Office of Telehealth uh, come and give training to all of our staff. Um, they have ongoing training that they have to do. When any new staff uh, join, there are some uh, critical things that they need to know. Uh, again, this is from uh, the Office of Telehealth in terms of training that's done before they can see uh, any patient, um, and then some uh, other training that's done within 30 or 60 days of the start of their training. And does part of that training um, include the concept of informed consent for a patient to enter into a telehealth program? Um, I'm, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can address that. So sure. anytime a, a veteran is, is being considered for telehealth, they have to provide at least uh, verbal consent to participate in the program. So that's one of our program requirements. And Not just for home telehealth, but all telehealth. And is there some record of that, record keeping? It should be that? in the uh, document in the note uh, by the provider doing the referral or by the care coordinator or the provider who's receiving the referral. Okay. Were there any disciplinary proceedings? Yes. Uh, the associate chief nurse uh, received a 21-day suspension, unpaid suspension. Okay. Um, so moving on, I think I'd like to go to Dr. Galpin just in terms of what the opportunities are with this technology. Could you just expound upon what some of the new initiatives will be under this anywhere, any, any time, um, anywhere to anywhere, if you could expand upon that? So and I, whether or not 
there's action needed by Congress to effectuate the goals of this policy. <clears throat> Thank you. Actually, um, we may need to spend about 10 minutes on, on that because I, I think this is an incredible. I've got two and a half, but we'll. I've got a good relationship with the general. We have, so we, we have some flexibility. I'm feeling, I'm feeling good about the flexibility. Yep. <laughs> so let me just start by by talking about the the direction we're going because I think it's an incredibly exciting direction and it's it's hard to kind of talk about everything we're doing unless I can kind of break it up into categories. So the way I think of it, and there's all different ways to think of it, is things we're doing at the facility level, things we're doing at the regional level, things we're doing at the national level. So first of all, at the, at the facility level, our expectation is that telehealth is just going to be integrated into all the services we provide to make it more accessible. So really, when you look across the broad spectrum of clinical services that we provide in the VA or any healthcare provides, every specialty can add telehealth as a component of their care. Some can do pretty much all their care through telehealth. Some can do a portion of their care through telehealth. So we want to make it so easy to do telehealth that it's like picking up the phone. And that's where our VA Video Connect application comes in. We want to make it easy. I want to be able to send a link to a veteran and say, hey, let's jump on a video call. Because you called in, said you have a rash, and I'd like to look at it. Where I got your x-ray back today, and I want to show it to you, not just describe it to you. We also want providers to be able to say, instead of coming back to see me in two weeks for your follow-up, would you rather have a video appointment so you don't have to leave your home? So that integration of just the day-to-day -day operations is key, and that's going to happen at the facility level. We also think for, for some of our, our very large medical centers that have maybe 10 community-based outpatient clinics, they have challenges with uh, meeting surge demand. So on any given day, you could have a provider out at a remote CBOC or community-based outpatient clinic that may be two hours away from your main facility. You can't figure out a way to staff up for that surge or contingency. But with telehealth, you could have some centralized providers who at a moment's notice could be directed to that CBOC saying, we have a provider out. Let's have them work there and take care of refills, anything that they can do for telehealth through the day to cover for that, that out provider. We can also have, if we have a bunch of same-day sick patients coming to that clinic, we could say, you know, we have 20 patients waiting here, and it's two hours away from anywhere else. Let's uh, focus our resources there today to decrease that wait time for, for same-day sick. We also think, because it's really, really important, and I'm sure anyone who's ever taken care of a family member realizes, when you have someone who has a lot of medical comorbidities, it's really important to have family members and caregivers attend appointments, hear what the doctors are saying, help with the medications. And so with telehealth, not just getting care more accessible for, for the veterans and patients, but actually saying, if you want to attend this appointment remotely because you have a full-time job and it's hard to leave for the whole day, or you have sick children at home, we want to give you an opportunity to attend virtually so you can participate in the conversation. So at, at the facility level, it, it's a lot about accessibility. It's about making that care more convenient, bringing it into the home, bringing the family members and caregivers in, helping to, to, to share clinical resources in the local area. At the regional level, we start looking at capacity. So there are parts of the country, rural communities, where it's very challenging to hire a provider. A provider leaves. Maybe it's a year and a half, two years before we can really replace them in person. Through telehealth, what we can do is we can say, all right, well, that rural community is close to a major metropolitan city. We're going to hire contingency staff in that location. When you lose your provider locally, we're going to fit in by telehealth so we have consistency in our access. When you can hire a provider, we'll, we'll pull out. But in the meantime, the veteran's care is not going to be impacted. We're going to have a regular provider filling in for that person. So on the regional level, it's really important that we be able to share our clinical resources, and that's where the Anywhere to Anywhere authority comes in. Because we are not aligned where every rural community has a metropolitan city right next to them in their state that has authority to provide telehealth. Sometimes we have to go across state lines. <coughs> At the regional level, we also want to work on our telephone systems and add telehealth into uh, what we're doing with call centers. So in the middle of the night or anytime, 24 hours a day, we'd like to see it. If a veteran calls in and they have a complaint or a concern that can be addressed with a provider, we'd like to have a provider available who can get on a video call or an audio call with them and say, let me take care of this so we're not sending you to the emergency room if we don't need to. We're sending you to a clinic where you'd have to wait because there's 10 other people who showed up on the same day. At the national level, it's a lot about quality. So what we can do with telehealth is I can take 
the expert provider who is maybe one of the top researchers in a rare condition who works in VA Connecticut, and I can make their services available to the small number of veterans anywhere in the country that has that rare condition. That's another way where place where we need the anywhere to anywhere <coughs> authority. We can't license and maintain licenses in every state. So to be able to provide that level of service and be able to do it in the home or the places that are most convenient for veterans, we need to have the authority to be able to say, we should not have barriers. If I have a provider who can deliver a service, if I have a veteran who needs a service, we should be able to connect them simply, no questions asked. That's why that initiative is, is so important for, for us. And, and just uh, last question, do we, um, is there legislation that's required for that initiative to do this lic federal licensing or, or cross-border licensing? So we have the authority in the VA to get us most of the way there. And that's what the Secretary and the President were talking about um, at their event. So the VA has existing authority if we put out regulations. We have always preferred a legislative approach to this. It is the, the best solution. Legislation mm -hmm. can take us farther than regulations can. We can develop new authorities through that. There are veterans that we will not be able to reach because they live across the border in Canada. They drive in for, for service to a VA, but then they go back home. They're now in another country. Our regulations would not allow us to, to treat those veterans through anywhere and anywhere. Um, there are also other things with controlled substances that are federal laws that we can't impact with our, our VA regulations. So again, we can get to you know a 90% solution. We can do certainly a lot more with regulations than our existing authority. Legislation would be by far the preferred choice. Great, I yield back. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Galpin, you seem to be the first name on here. By the way, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to tell you, uh, um, Ranking Member Custer, that that question and your response was probably the the most relevant and and motivating interaction that I have heard in all of our all of our hearing uh, testimonies to date since we've been together as a as a committee for the last six plus months. Um, because what I heard you say, Dr. Galpin, was you, you had the ability to redirect assets out of the C box, whatever it happens to be. The provider's out for the day, something wrong, connect someone via telehealth, uh, and still provide the, the capability. And, and uh, in previous hearings, we've talked, I've talked about using, you know, the, the military method of the surge. This is a different form of that, but it's a redistribution of assets to get the job done. I, I, I commend you for that type of, of, of attitude and, and, and pro, you know, proactive uh, response. So let me ask you a slightly different question here, uh, Dr. Galpin. Um, VA provided figures that indicate that the telehealth enrollment overall um, is growing, but home telehealth is shrinking. Can you explain? Give me give me a, some whys on that. Yeah. So let me let me provide a little bit of context on on what we describe as home telehealth because I think there there are two different programs that need to be considered here. So one, we have our monitoring program, and that's what we traditionally call home telehealth. Then we have video into the home, which is the, the, the VA Video Connect. That's Could you describe do. just the, the, the monitoring? Describe the, what are we, how, how are we monitoring in the, in the home telehealth? So what we do is we, we enroll veterans in a program, and uh, in most cases, in about two-thirds of cases, we will provide them a device in their home. And that device can connect by Internet, but it can also connect by telephone line. We enroll them in what we call a disease management protocol. So let's say they have diabetes and they have hypertension. The equipment has protocols in it to ask them questions. How are you feeling today? Did you take your medications? They can put in their blood pressure. They can put in their, their blood sugar uh, records. And then there's a nurse on the other end or some care coordinator, doesn't necessarily have to be a nurse, in most cases it is, uh, who is monitoring that data. And they set parameters and say, you know, if the blood pressure gets up to this high, the <coughs> system gives you a red flag. And so that care coordinator works with the veteran, essentially a conduit between them and the organization. If they see parameters going outside the control, they see something happening with the veteran that is concerning, they call them up, they can educate them, they can connect them with the provider. So it's, it's a group of nurses essentially that have dashboards and they have regular information that's coming in from veterans who are in their home to make sure that they're staying on a, a, a good pathway in their disease management. So that's the monitoring program. Okay. So it's daily monitoring. The, the video into the home program is more episodic care. 
So this is when someone calls and says, oh, I, I would like to have an appointment for this rash. And I say, great, let's get on a video. It's a one-time event. Maybe it's a scheduled event. Maybe it's an ad hoc event. We connect by video. We are seeing each other. We are hearing each other. And so that's video into the home. The video into the home, when we looked at the end of quarter three data, that program has grown by over 70% over the last year's growth rate or over the last year's growth. That is the program that we're seeing expanded. The remote monitoring program, as you say, those numbers have declined over the last several years. That is a resource-constrained program. Nurses can only manage so many patients and monitor them successfully and safely. Unless we add nurses to the program, those numbers will stay static. And that has been the situation we've been in for several years. On top of that, in I think it was 2014, our community got together and wanted to put standards for the amount of veterans that can be safely monitored through that program. Previously, there was about 90 to 150 veterans that could be monitored. When that group got together and they said, well, we can do that, however, when we cross cover, when someone's out and suddenly we're monitoring two to 300 veterans, that is not a safe practice. And so they created a panel size calculator that based on the complexity of the panels and what you anticipate to be your kind of panel makeup of complex versus non-complex patients, it, it's, it produces recommendations on what your panel size should be. And that produced an average panel size of about, I think, 80 to 85 veterans per nurse. And so it kind of decreased that, that total number of, of veterans that we can enroll based on the existing staff. So we're not seeing heavy growth, we're not seeing any growth in that, in that program at this point. Okay. Um, you know, I think um, since we, just the two of us, uh, we can just kind of go back and forth here and ask um, our questions. So we decided great. we've asked enough questions. Is that okay? That's perfect. Okay, you want to go great. again? I'm happy to, right. yeah. So just to pick up on that um, before we leave it, so uh, more resources, more personnel resources would be needed. What about the equipment in the home? What, what are the constraints on that? And are there recommendations about um, equipment in the home for participation. I mean, I, I just want to say uh, I've been surprised and very, very impressed, for example, that mental health treatment can be provided very effectively by telehealth. I, I did not anticipate that. And I, uh, up north in my district, this is not far from the Canadian border, um, we have a, a CBOC, but we also have um, veterans uh, centers that are just for mental health and they were able to provide care as long as the veteran was sitting comfortably in a chair in a room with privacy on the phone on the television with their mental health provider but what how do we address the equipment in order to bring that kind of treatment into the home so there um, so I'm going to separate again. Again, we have the remote monitoring program, and that's something that we can supply. So we have a central distribution mechanism when the veteran gets enrolled in the program. They can be distributed out equipment for home monitoring. Uh, we also have an option. They can use their own phones or their own Internet, though it's, it's a much smaller percentage of, of veterans that actually use their own devices for home monitoring. For the video into the home, I think that's the category I think you're focusing on, on yep. most. So I break it down into three categories of accessibility for, for the veteran in the home in that case. So we have veterans that live in areas where they can get broadband or high-speed internet, they subscribe to it, and they have devices that are video capable. In that case, we can use that VA Video Connect application, send them a link, and we can connect them, we can do video conferencing. And what you're saying about mental health is true. It's also true for many other specialties. I mean, imagine the, the amount of, of specialties that don't require any physical examinations or the amount of appointments that don't require physical examination other than visual. So mental health, social work, pharmacy, speech therapy. I mean, there's a, a long list where a very complete appointment can be provided through video conferencing. Uh, second category of veteran is veterans who live in, a, in an area that maybe has broadband, 4G connectivity, but they may not have their own device or they may not subscribe to that bandwidth. So VA in this case has a program uh, where we can distribute out a connected tablet. So it has 4G connectivity, we ship it to the veteran, they can use it. Uh, we've distributed about 6,000 of those or over 6,000 of those. That is certainly an area where we could get assistance. I don't know if it, the right answer is a public-private partnership, but that is a resource limit. There's a point where we do run out. We have to buy more and um, 
So are the VSOs involved at all in that program? Do you know? In the the veteran service organizations in the distribution or the purchase or not maybe that that's I'm something aware. we can look into. I could look into that, but I'm not aware yeah. of that. Okay. So, so we do have a way to get, again, veterans the, the connectivity and the device for that service. And, I mean, we think that's certainly a great opportunity. We'd like to be able to do more of that where it's needed. The third category is, is the most challenging is the – so we have veterans. And, and we looked at this. I'm not, these are not official numbers, but we, we had asked Rural Health at the beginning of the year to give us a list of, like, where are veterans located? How many veterans do we have? In communities that have no broadband, no 4G connectivity, and that would be my district. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and mine. So Michigan. I this think is why we've come together on this issue. <laughs> so I mean, these are approximate numbers, but nationally, we at least in that initial uh, data query, we found about 40,000 veterans living in those areas. In Michigan, it was like 1,500. New Hampshire, it was like 300. 40,000 nationally. Yeah. Oh, we should be able to crack this. Yeah, so these are preliminary numbers. Again, I wasn't asking, you know, for it was, you know, just give. No, but it's I not like to, yeah, four million. Yes. So that's the, th those are the, the most challenging because we can't ship them a connected tablet and, and have it work. And, and this is where I think local communities and the VA need to be working together. Again, public-public partnerships, public-private partnerships. And to say, okay, here's a, a veteran community or a community that has 11,000 veterans in it that don't have connectivity. We can't provide the services we want to provide into the home or close to their home. Well, let's find a building like this, maybe in a rural community that has a satellite connectivity. Let's see if we can reserve rooms. We can then send them a tablet and they can schedule time in a room at a library, at an academic site, at a you know town center, just so they can connect to their local VA or, or their distant VA providers. So that's a real opportunity. In, in the meantime, well, I mean, that's, that's probably the, the thing we should do, we, uh, we need to do first. But where Congress can help with this, and uh, I heard you ask that question earlier. I didn't really address it. I would certainly like some more time to talk about where we could get help from Congress. Uh, but making uh, bandwidth, making Internet uh, more of a utility, um, and I know that's a yes. bad word to some people, utility, but, you know, it, more like utility and that it's available everywhere so yeah. it, you know maybe it's there's a combination where there's diff different levels i know again it's it's a touchy area co utility versus commodity but we really should have that service everywhere and we got to figure out ways and support companies that want to do that va can't set up internet connectivity all over the country but there are people who can and, and that's a big area and that will help us tremendously well and a lot of veterans i mean i'm sure general bergman's seen this but that in my district they they um are choosing to live a rural life and it are many of our Vietnam era veterans came back and chose to live in a more remote mm -hmm. area and mental health wise that's probably healthy for them they get out they go hunting and fishing and snowmobiling and um, it, it works well for them but it's not just their health that would benefit from the connectivity it's their economic opportunities it's their personal opportunities staying connected to family and friends so um, I think it's definitely something worth looking into I'll yield back thank you um, dr. Wong in your home telehealth enrollment audit you found that less sick and younger veterans were being targeted for enrollment uh, and the sicker and more elderly vet at veterans were being de-emphasized. Can you can you put some more meat on that bone? Give further explanation and and what effect it had on the home telehealth enrollment overall. So the meat on those bones were done by audit, and that's why I can't speak to that. Um, I'm from the healthcare division, so I can speak to the Detroit uh, issue with the home telehealth. But as far as that that number and that report goes, that goes to the audit division of IG which I was not involved with. So yeah. I need to go find the audit division the, of IG exactly. to answer that. And I can, I can get that. You uh, can direct get, me. Absolutely. Are they in D.C.? And I will. Uh, they're, they're in D.C. Oh, <laughs> good. Uh, good. And when we get back there, we and can I will, have a little um, direct meeting. I will get that question to them, actually. Okay. Yep. So then let me go to a, just kind of an extra one. You know, in, in, your, in your Detroit report, mm -hmm. you made recommendations to ensure that no one, you know, manipulates any more enrollment. Okay. Uh, the recommendations were to retain everyone 
make sure policy is followed, correct the veterans' telehealth records, and to consider taking personnel action. Have those recommendations been resolved? So the uh, education has been resolved. Uh, we're still waiting for the facility to give us data on the uh, surveillance of notes uh, that uh, confirm or not confirm that uh, telehealth has been delivered uh, appropriately and documented. Um, the administrative action, uh, that note uh, is uh, still in process. We, we know that it's been done, but we have to have a, an official um, uh, documentation of that. Okay. And I'm going to ask one more question, and I'm going to yield back. Uh, That's right. uh, uh, so. Dr. Reeves, uh, a 21 that the, the uh, associate uh, chief of nursing received a 21-day suspension. Yes. Was that with or without pay? Without pay. Without pay. Uh, in your in your opinion, or that of those you've consulted with, was that appropriate, or did that send a strong enough message throughout the system that that kind of behavior would not be tolerated? I think it's in a strong message um, we've never I've never uh, given any given anyone a 21 day suspension a manager 21 day suspension uh, without pay um, and so we thought it was appropriate okay I yield back so I just want to follow up before we leave here on uh, one issue that we haven't covered and I'll start with dr. Wong but if anyone uh, wants to follow up on that um, this is with regard to the mobile medical units, another way of servicing rural communities. Um, two questions is, are you aware that the VA has a better accounting system at this time to locate these mobile medical units and, and keep track of them? Um, and, and secondly, I would just ask you, given the situation uh, down south in Texas, Louisiana, are they able to um, bring these units in in an emergency to provide care, both veterans and non-veteran population? So uh, the mobile medical unit, again, was a different audit report. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. okay. It was an audit report and was in the health care inspection report. So I cannot speak for that. Okay. A anyone else on the panel able to speak to that, the mobile units? Yeah. So I'll, I'll qualify by saying I am not the subject matter expert for mobile medical units. Sure. I, I can help with some of the responses, and we'll need to probably take some of it back to record okay. uh, for the record. So uh, the mobile medical units are under emergency management. Um, based on the OIG recommendations, a new policy was developed that was just actually published in, in July that gives criteria for managing the mobile medical units. And I understand that a report is going to Congress yearly on the number, connectivity, use of those mobile medical okay. units. So I know last year, for instance, we had 27 reporting clinical workload. They produced 27,000 approximately encounters, did about 4,000 telehealth encounters. Um, so they are, they are being tracked much more closely under a program, under po and policy now, but it is emergency management. And regarding the question, I think it's a great question as far as how can we help Texas right now? Um, how can we help the Houston area? And there's been a tremendous amount of conversation over the last couple of days about what can telehealth do? And we have providers jumping out of their seats saying, I want to help. How can I help? How can I get involved? Uh, we know we have mobile vet centers. I think we have one mobile medical unit and vet center in the area. Um, the manager for the mobile vet center said I think they have nine that are in, within a one-day drive if needed to bring into the area. Um, so it's at this point working with our central command trying to figure out exactly what needs to happen. So yeah. we'll, there'll be a lot more to come on this um, and we can certainly give you an after action. But And I can certainly is. say we had a flood in our Manchester, New Hampshire facility uh, last month and a number of mobile units were brought in from surrounding areas and have been very, very helpful for um, all different types. I think it would be useful actually for our committee to tour and get a handle on how these are useful for all different types of you know, again, it was mental health, it was primary care, it was different clinics that were able to continue even after this flood. So it, it was it was good. Um, I'm just going to go to Dr. Constantian, who came all the way out here, to is there anything that you would like to add from, from your area of expertise, anything that we should know or anything that Congress can be doing with regard to IT 
Um, I guess my biggest question has to do with the change in the electronic health record and how that would impact telehealth and is there an off-the-shelf um, option here that we'll be able to move forward quickly or are we going to have a, uh, I won't use a technical term, <laughs> in terms of what's what's going to happen next with the new electronic health record and our intent to expand telehealth. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member uh, Custer. So um, I, I know probably the uh, arrangements that we're trying to move forward on with Cerner based on Secretary uh, Shulkin's determination and findings from early June uh, are probably of greatest interest to uh, you and Chairman Bergman. Uh, However, those uh, negotiations have not resulted yet in a contract, so it would be sort of premature, premature probably for me to comment on that, sort of specifically what that software would bring to the table in terms of uh, telehealth support. Uh, I would say, though, that um, IT and uh, the Office of Information Technology and Veterans Health Administration, uh, my office, uh, uh, partnering with another uh, element, the Enterprise Program Management Office uh, in particular, and uh, Dr. Galpin's office in uh, VHA have formed a, a very tight partnership in terms of the vision for telehealth and what the IT supports are that are required to undergird that. And many of those, not all, but many of those, I'd say even most, are not electronic health record uh, specific. It's more in, in the area of infrastructure and capacity to build out that strategy. So, um, uh, assuming we go forward with Cerner, but uh, and the contract is, is let, we, we will have sort of some work that interfaces with Cerner, but a lot of the work that we have in terms of expanding infrastructure uh, is independent of the electronic health record choice that we take. So I'll yield back, but it, we may take back to our committee. I would suggest that we have a presentation on for the full committee on telehealth and the expansion of telehealth, and then maybe if we do it in a way that's timely to the announcement about where we're headed with the electronic health record, and then you could describe that infrastructure. I think that'd be of, of interest, certainly, as we, we've got some big hearings coming up this fall about the future of the VA and what it looks like in terms of facilities and care in the community and care in the home. And I think it's going to be important for our members to un have a thorough understanding of what's possible. And potentially the VA can be on the cutting edge as, as we have been in, you know, as the VA has been in so many other areas, it would be really exciting to see the VA be leading the way in telehealth. So thank you. I appreciate you taking the trip, and I definitely appreciate the testimony. I'll yield back. Thank you. Um, sometimes, well, I guess I've never heard this question asked in, in a hearing like this, but this is your opportunity, any of the four of you, to, to offer to myself and Ranking Member Custer your thoughts on where Congress either could be more helpful or in some cases Just less, get out of less helpful. <laughs> I'll open it up to anyone who would like to offer a comment on that. Dr. Galpin. Yes. By the way, we don't shoot the messenger here. <laughs> I, I, I will be respectful. Uh, no, I, I appreciate I, that. I, I, I appreciate that that question. I mean, I think this is this is a partnership. I mean, we we look to you all for leadership um, and direction uh, as much as we do from our own agency. So it's important that we're all working together, and you understand where we have challenges, uh, and 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 can look to you for for help in those areas. Uh, I'll go through a, just a couple, and the, the first is that legislation, that anywhere to anywhere legislation. Um, that and overcoming some of the issues with our ability to provide comprehensive care through telemedicine. So with the Controlled Substance Act and the, the, the portion of that, which is the Online Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act of 2008, these are things that we either need, uh, we need action from somewhere to help overcome. Uh, I think legislation is, again, still the best approach. It's the most comprehensive. It could potentially still be done faster than we can get regulations through comment periods. That's something we still need to, to put out for the public. 
Um, so that is an area that we would certainly love, you know, very comprehensive support. The other is, is IT infrastructure, and I'm going to put that in the category of both VA IT and community IT. So in the VA, um, our IT is, is separate. They have a, a, a separate budget from us. Uh, sometimes we have needs in our program, and I'll, I'll give you the figures I have. We did an assessment of what we wanted to do with VA Video Connect, the services in the home, and to do what we felt we wanted to do, it was going to require an additional $25 million of IT funds per year to make that happen. That's something that currently we don't have funds for, and th those, those monies sit in a very different pocket from the other money that we may have. Are those funds restricted? In other words, restricted to with, within that pot by, is that by legislative, or yeah. what means restricted? What put up the barrier? Well, in, in, in 2006, there was a separate, uh, uh, there was legislation to create a separate IT appropriation for IT expenditures, and, and there was a rationale for that. There was mm -hmm. a, uh, the ability to account a, across the department for whatever IT expenditures there were. It had perhaps an unintended consequence uh, by separating out the monies, uh, whereby there might be enough money in, in situations like telehealth where you need medical funds for clinicians, for some of the infrastructure that's not IT, uh, but you also need to partner those funds with IT. And what I was going to, well, in, in terms of responding to your question, uh, Chairman Bergman, I was going to say one thing that we experience in Office Information Technology in healthcare is that there are so many excellent ideas that require IT funding, typically between three times and five times the amount of money that we have available for development of those services. So we have to make very difficult choices. Uh, there are safety issues, there are other uh, suicide prevention uh, demands, uh, other demands for that IT support, and we just we can't fund all of the good ideas that the Veterans Health Administration has in terms of benefiting veterans. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and so I'll skip kind of ahead and, and come back to the IT infrastructure because the appropriations thing, it's, it, this falls under a big category of let's make government more simple and intuitive. And so I, I have a budget, but it's split into three pockets, and I may have plenty of money in this pocket, but I need to buy something that requires this money, and I can't do it. And it becomes because very, of legislation. Because of legislation, because they're separate, and I believe it's legislation. It's separate appropriations, and and there's a lot of anxiety and fear in the government over this. It's well, if I use this for the wrong purpose, I mean. So I'm going to put words in your mouth here. You, you are the boots on the ground. You're in the middle of the fight. You've got assets over here, and you've got assets over here, and you're being limited from using the assets to do the right thing for the right reason at the right time because of legislation. Did Correct. I get that right? Correct. And, and in the area of telehealth, it's, it's particularly confusing because we have a, a clinical bucket of money and we have a technology IT bucket of money. And, and where do we sit? When I buy a tablet for a veteran, is it an IT money? Is it clinical money? And depending on the situation, it could be either. And so that confuses people. And if you buy it for one purpose and then want to repurpose it for another, then you've used the wrong type of money. So it's again, the, the legislation is inhibiting or right. preventing you as a, as, as a leader who's in the fight, boots on the ground, from basically winning the battle. Doing the right thing. That you are in the middle of. Correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was hearing what you were saying. Now, sir, I, I would add that there are mechanisms for transferring between those buckets of money, but they are. Who created the mechanisms? Uh, sir, I, can, I can't uh, uh, comment on that in terms of different uh, appropriations. But what I would say is that um, it requires uh, it, it requires a notification of Congress and so so so, it, so the shifts between the appropriations can't be done sort of quickly. Uh, there, there's some okay. lag period. So the, the, the process exists. Okay. Um. But that creates for us um, a lot of challenges in the telehealth space. And along with simplifying government, 
I think the, our ability to buy things in the government is incredibly complex. And sometimes we go through years of contracting and, you know, very, I mean, just protests and after actions, and it becomes incredibly challenging. So you start out, you know, again, working with the buckets of money. You have a budget that comes, you know, for, for one or two years at a time. And then the, the time to actually act on something you're trying to act on is incredibly complex and long. And so I think, you know, for us in telehealth, that's another area where we're trying to move things quickly. And we're in an area of significant growth. And we want to be the leader in, in, in this area. Having to wait for a couple of years to get new technology in uh, is an incredible challenge. And again, there's a lot of anxiety about how do you do it right? How do you make sure you follow all the rules? Um, so just, again, simplifying. I would say hiring's in the third category of that. Again, I'm all set. keep talking. We just need to simplify the way we do things so we have an intuitive system that people can, if, they, if they're doing the right thing, that should be in line with the laws and the regulations. And so, you know, I, I think that's a huge area of opportunity. Um, going back to, to the initial question, though, about what we can do for telehealth right now, the legislation, uh, the IT infrastructure, so helping helping with that internet expansion in the community, helping with our IT expansion in the VA to support what we're trying to do, and then simplification of policies and procedures uh, that just make our system very complex to move quickly. Okay. Well, um, thank you. Great. We have had a little discussion up here amongst the ranking member and myself, and I believe you're you're I'm all set, all set and satisfied, and. Uh, this um, we're going to to move forward with a uh, if you will do you have any closing statements or anything that you want to say because I'm just going to close the hearing on just to say thank you I've had a wonderful time in Michigan thank you for the invitation and thank you to all of you for traveling here as well I'm going to uh, to uh, just again echo the ranking members words and, and thank you for making the effort to be here thank you for the continuing education on both parts because um, uh, in uh, in good business group doesn't make any difference what the unit of measure is interactions everybody works together everybody knows what their responsibilities are everybody should know what they're being held accountable for and uh, but m probably most importantly we need to feel as though we're in an environment where we can clash in a collaborative positive way and come out maybe maybe a little bit bloodied in the short term <laughs> but nonetheless nothing that's going to cause permanent damage but our mission moves forward because of the fact that we we tangled with with, with one another so I, I i thank you for that and uh, the roles and missions we talk a lot about in the military and I was kind of alluding to in my comments here about the, you know, what's the role of Congress? What's the role of the VA? What's the role here and there? Uh, it, roles and missions is a, something that's continuing based on the fight you're in, okay, and based on the capabilities you've been assigned to bring to the, bring to the, to the table. So I, I, I will tell you, uh, Dr. Reeves, uh, as someone in the military who holds people accountable, I really don't think 21 day suspension was enough. I just want to let you know that I that is that is stuck somewhere in my system right now because um, whether you're no matter what you're doing in the end if somebody gets hurt because somebody didn't do the right thing um, there is no excuse for that and you have to send a message that is so strikingly clear that the if anyone even considers doing something like that again it means that the message wasn't right on the front end so I just would offer that advice as a as a, as a former military commander so I just want to thank you all all of you witnesses today for for being with us and for your thoughtful testimony the panel is now excused the VA has a long recognized has long recognized the opportunities that telehealth presents to bridge the distances not only between its facilities and at vet in its veterans in rural areas but utilizing these techniques to build on what the expectations will be for future veterans who have yet to even 
you know, if you will, these are the, the folks that we're talking about now are the ones who haven't signed up to join the military yet. They're the toddlers using their screens at home. They'll have their Fitbit on that really, they'll know their, their provider through some type of device. And, and that is the future that we're, you know, we're looking at. But we have an opportunity as, the, as veterans health care, especially, and, and providers of services to our veterans to be on the leading edge. And we cannot miss that opportunity. So, you know, after rolling out the telehealth nationally in 2003 and significantly expanding it in 2011, I believe the department is at another key moment for growth, for opportunity. Telehealth is already a billion dollar enterprise for the VA. It seems to be headed into the multi-billions. We have to make sure that those administration, administrative systems and enabling technology keep up with the the needs if you will in such a way there's such a thing as being on the leading edge but not so far out on the edge that you're assuming unnecessary technological risk if you will with uh, you know we're not going to be the R&D in some ways but yet we'll be the implementers of good R&D we also have to stay mindful of previous incidents of well-intentioned performance metrics motivating bad behavior. We already talked about that. VA is engaged in a very consequential planning for its future. So the big issues are where and how new hospitals should be built, if at all. You know, what is the best mix, mix of in-house and community, what that mix of in-house and community care looks like and how to move forward with a optimal technology for the moment because we know when we put something in place, it's going to change. Telehealth touches every issue, and I want to make sure that that is always part of our conversation, because as you heard Ranking Member Custer talk about her, the rural nature of her district, the rural nature of my district, um, if it'll work in our districts, it'll work anywhere. And we, we look forward to being that, that, that test bed, if you will, in some ways to see what works and what doesn't, because I guarantee you, our constituents don't beat around the bush. They'll get, they'll get right to it very quickly. So, uh, you know, thanks for making that part of the conversation. I look forward, as always, to working with Ranking Member Custer, and I'm also looking forward to talking with her back in D.C. and hearing of her exploits here in our beautiful First District and <laughs> all, the, all the hospitality she enjoyed. So, you know, we're going to be all in this together to make telehealth what it can be. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and to include extraneous material. Without objection, so ordered. Again, once again, thank you to all of you and those of you in the audience who came today. Thanks for joining us here this morning. Uh, with that, this hearing is now adjourned. Well done, sir. That's great. Did you fly? Mm -hmm. Did you drive or fly? I drove. Yeah. 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 It's quite, it's quite hard. <laughs> <laughs>